the reason for having these meetings is that on the spiritual path, our mind does not stay too long. When we come to a meeting like this, we get inspired. We say, this is the true path. This is what should be given our highest priority. We go home and start meditation, feel happy. And that great euphoria lasts a few days. After that, we are back to where we were. That is why it's important to reignite our enthusiasm by these monthly meetings. In fact, if we could have these meetings more often, would it be even better? How often should you have a satsang? The best is to have it every day. But if we cannot meet every day, at least once a week, and if that is not uh, possible, then once a month should be the minimum. For those who are living overseas, if they can come and attend a meeting and hold on to that excitement for a year, once a year may be good enough. But if you cannot come for once a year, might have to wait for the next life for spiritual enlightenment. Somebody had asked my master, great master, Azur Maharaj Baba Savan Singh, the same question. He said, how often should we come to have your darshan? He said, if possible, you should see me every day. If, of course, you are not living there with me, and you cannot see me every day, once a week would be fine. And they said, how about if we are living far away? He said, once a month should be good enough. What if we are living beyond the seven seas in foreign countries? He said, then once a year is good enough. He says, what about if we cannot come once a year? He said, then you might as well prepare to come for another life. So this is not something that we easily hold on to. And that is why it is necessary to be in the company of the truth. Satsang. Satsang literally means the company of the truth. And where is truth? Where we speak about truth, where we share truth, where we share the teachings of the Guru who gives us the knowledge of the truth. This word Guru that I just used has also been used in so many senses that people have come up to me and said, what is the difference between different gurus that you talk about? Sometimes you say there is a Saad Guru, then there is a Sat Guru, then you talk of other gurus of different levels of consciousness. What is the difference? Because we don't know. We think the word Guru means a teacher, any teacher. The truth is that the word Guru, which is of course a Sanskrit word, the origin of the word Guru is in Sanskrit. Its eti etymology says, its roots say, that it comes from the two syllables, Gu, Ru. Literally, in Sanskrit, Gu means a shadow. Ru means one who can remove it, dispeller of a shadow. Translated, it means one who can enlighten you by removing the darkness of ignorance. That means one who can transfer knowledge to us. That is why a teacher who teaches us, gives us knowledge, we have been referring to as a guru. But in the spiritual context, a guru is considered far more than merely a teacher. The word guru has been used in India, even till today, for several professional workers. In the teaching of music, all the great teachers in India have been called gurus. In teaching dances, dance classes, the teachers are referred to as gurus of those different disciplines. So the word guru has been widely used. Sometimes it has been used in a derogatory sense also. Sometimes a great cheat is called, he is quite a guru in his own job. So therefore, the word guru has been used in all these contexts. But when we come to the spiritual disciplines, there the guru is given so much eminence, is considered almost equal to the creator. In one of the big mantras they speak in Hinduism, they call it the Guru Mantra. That means the mantra relating to the Guru. It's considered next in importance to the Gayatri Mantra, which is a general Hindu mantra for de describing the presence of God in creation. When they talk of the Guru Mantra, it says, Guru Brahma, 
Guru is the creator. Guru Vishnu, that means he is sustainer of the universe. Guru Dev, the same Guru Mantra says, Guru Deva Maheshwara, he is also Shiva. Then it says Guru is Shak Sat Par Brahma, he is also one beyond this creator. And then he says to such a Guru, Guru Devo, Shri Guru Devo, this my Nama. That means I am saluting that kind of a Guru. A Guru who is all in all, everything. Another holy scripture of ours in India, we say, Guru Gobind, dono khade, kiske lagu pae, balehari guru apne, jen Gobind diye malai, which means if God and Guru were both standing together, who would I salute? Whose feet will I touch? The answer is the feet of the Guru, because without him I would never have known God. So the Guru is given that importance in the spiritual context and considered to be the ultimate creative power made into a human being. They consider that the ultimate Satpurush himself resides, the consciousness of the ultimate resides in a human being. In the Christian Bible is considered that the, the Word made flesh. The Word was made flesh, made into a body and could be expressed as the creative power. And what is the Word? The same Word that created everything. In the beginning was the Word. John's Gospel says, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. All things were made by Him and nothing was made that was not made by Him. When you refer to the Word, you refer to Shabd, you refer to the Bani, when you talk of these words, which all are references to something that can be heard, audible things. When you use these audible words to describe the creative power of the whole universe, then we realize that we are talking of word-made flesh that be the ultimate creative power that even created God, it resides in a guru, in the form of a human being. That means the human being at all times carries the totality of consciousness with him. When we are on a spiritual discipline and we rise slowly to experience higher levels of consciousness, we experience only one reality at one time. Right now, our physical reality, our physical body and the material reality arising from experiencing what is around us through the physical body is the only reality. We know nothing else. When we go to sleep, we are unaware of this reality and we create a dream reality. And the dream becomes real for us while we are sleeping. When we wake up, this reality comes into being, dream becomes a dream and unreal. Similarly, when we go to the next level of awareness, called the Sukshma Shadir awareness or the astral body awareness, a whole astral world opens up showing us that the only reality, that what we thought was physical, was actually unreal and dreamlike. We go higher up, to the causal reality, Karl and Sharir reality, and we find that the cause of all things is the only reality. All this was illusion, creating experiences for us. But at that time, that is the only reality. Then we go higher up and discover our own true self, our soul, without any mind, without any body, without any senses. We discover that's the only reality. Everything was made from there. These experiences generate in us a different level of experience of reality. And we discover what looks real at one stage is not real when you go to a higher level of consciousness. But when you go beyond the knowledge of the self, when you go beyond the knowledge of your atma or soul and discover that you have always been part of the one creative power, that you were never separated from it, that in your true home there is all the realities and all the unrealities put together, that everything that took place in all levels was taking place from there and within that area of experience. When you reach totality of consciousness, you discover all realities and all illusions which make realities to be there together. Huge difference between the awareness of totality of consciousness and the awareness of any other level of consciousness. In totality, you discover that you are there at all levels at all times you are also there in the illusions that are being created. The show is taking place at all these levels. When we talk of a perfect living master, a Sant Sat Guru, then we talk of further adjectives we add to the word Guru, and we talk of a Sat Guru, a true Guru, we are talking of such a human being 
who has that awareness with him at all times. Not one who has been to that experience and come back to tell us. That is not a perfect living master. Not one who can go when he likes to those areas and come back and tell us. That's not a perfect living master. A perfect living master by definition is one who is carrying the awareness of totality and the awareness of all levels at the very time when he's just an ordinary human being sitting amongst us. So it's a very big difference. But anybody who reaches that state has the same experience. It's not that a perfect living master has a different experience. Any disciple of his, anybody who has worked his way up to the totality of consciousness has the same experience. Seeing the reality is all created by the process of illusion. We have not created these levels of consciousness as shadows or as illusions. We have used the process of illusion, a grand process of illusion, to create reality, to have real experiences. So that is why the whole creation that is around us is an extension of our own self, an extension of our true nature, of our true totality of consciousness to which we belong, which is our true self. And that is from where the whole experience is taking place at different levels. By dividing into different levels, we have created an immense variety of experiences. Imagine when you are only totality of consciousness. Now, of course, there will be no time, space, no mind, no thinking. We can't imagine it. But I'm trying to put analogies, just trying to give you comparisons for the sake of understanding. Supposing we were only totality of consciousness. In our true home, such can't. Supposing we are there, and we are all there, are we one or are we many? We are one, by definition. Ultimately, this is one creative power. We are one, experiencing the many. That means, within the one, we are the many. An analogy could be that the ocean is one, but the drops in the ocean are many. But they are not separate from the ocean. They are part of the ocean. How would you distinguish between a drop of water in the ocean from the ocean? It's still part of the ocean. It's just become a drop. It's a small fragment, small slice, small point of view, small position in the total ocean. This is exactly what a soul is. A soul is never separated from its totality. The soul never leaves its true home. The soul only contracts its awareness to be a small slice, a small part of totality of consciousness. And that's what we call a human soul. Assume a soul is a unit of consciousness that resides within totality of consciousness. And the experience of the one and the experience of the many is joint. And why should that experience take place? Why should we even consider? We look at the ocean, we don't look at the drops. When we look at the drops, we forget the ocean. What is the purpose of a drop in relation to the ocean? The purpose is to experience the closeness, the love of its own totality. If love is our true nature, and I believe it is, consciousness per se has certain qualities in it, certain functions in it, and the most prominent one is love. The ability to identify with another, the ability to experience the other, the experience to become the other, to put yourself totally in somebody else's place is love. True love is an unconditional experience of that kind. And to generate that experience, we have the many in the one, and the many can experience the love for each other and for the one. It's a great raison d'etre, a great reason for creation of the many. That if the true nature of God, people say God is love, in what way is he love if he is not able to love anybody, if, he, if no, nobody is there to love God? You can't say God is love, but there is no love there because there is nobody to love, nobody to love God. Therefore, if within God, souls can be created, not distinct from God, but part of God, then the experience of love takes place right there. That is why the experience of the many in the one is generated to have the experience of love, an experience that never goes away, even till the moment when we become human beings, even when we become other forms of life, even if we are in a dream state. This experience of love 
that generates their right in our true home in such kind never leaves us even if we are right here then what happens supposing you enlarge that experience further and from the individuated self which is a soul you add to it something that can create the sense of time and space that can create events that can create space distances it can create time and distance imagine how many events we can place into that framework and that framework is provided by attaching an accessory to the soul which is a body upon the soul which we call the causal body sometimes also called the human mind the human mind is that body which we attach to the soul to create the experience of a vastness of time and space infinite time has been created infinite space has been created by the addition of one little gadget called the human mind and the soul which is life itself consciousness itself empowers the mind to begin to work when the soul empowers the mind the gadget to work the mind begins to work what does it do start thinking and thinking ideas rationalization all these things come up because of the mind the soul is empowering the mind the mind is functioning and we have a variety of experiences now of events and time and space and we put the events on a timeline and we introduce a new law for making those interesting events the law of cause and effect also known as the law of karma the law of karma is merely to enhance the beauty of those events that we have placed upon a timeline and on the timeline each event has a cause and so we create a series of events on time and time never moves time was a straight line we drew put events on it and then we come to experience it by putting another cover upon ourselves the soul now wears a mind then it wears another cover called sense perceptions or the astral body or sukshma sharir that is nothing that sharir is nothing but sense perceptions it is not that it is another body we are putting on every time we think because we use the word body or a cover it must be like this body the physical body is material when you add sense perceptions to it becomes a physical astral body you put a mind into it becomes a mental astro physical body you put a soul into it it becomes a living astro physical body the soul is the life that gives life to all these three functions that are taking place now together so when you have sense perceptions the area of experience is advanced so much for the same consciousness which was total and remains total you add this physical body then the interesting part of the experience starts the most interesting part that you can have is when you have all these bodies including a physical body put on you then you become an individual entity and you consider the physical body to be yourself you forget it is just a cover upon yourself then you say i can see with my eyes i can touch with my hands i can have all the experiences sensory experiences forgetting those sensory experiences were merely covers upon yourself then you think and begin to decide things and thinking is a great great wonderful thing i don't think we ever got a greater gift than the gift of a mind to use and the gift of senses to perceive and gift of a body to have the whole thing condensed and and made into a physical world it's a very great gift to us to experience but we have started identifying ourselves only with the body as if the others don't exist they're just part of the body that they're physical things the physical body is the last cover we put on these are three big covers the fourth one the original one of becoming a soul from totality is very subtle and that is very hard even to express because it's beyond time and space beyond any notion that we can have beyond the mind so that is why <clears throat> when we have all these covers upon ourselves we forget how they are all operating we ascribe every activity that we have in this world to this body how can you describe love with this body how can you describe love even with the mind how can you describe love with sensory systems love does not come from any of these 
you can try to have love with any of these it never comes it comes directly from your soul love cannot come from anywhere else in fact if you try to use love in conjunction with these very often we destroy it the very first destroyer of the love that we experience is our own mind we think so hard that we destroy our own experience of love you fall in love with somebody what does the mind do next can i be sure do i really love does he or she really love what is this the mind which is a thinking machine given to us to enhance our experience we are using it to destroy our basic experience the basic experience of love which arises from consciousness and not from any of these covers we are using the covers to explain it away and then destroying it that is why we have other forms of experiences that belong directly to our consciousness and not to any cover apart from love and other experiences instant knowledge intuitive knowledge in knowing a knowing and awareness that is not coming from thinking we all have it we all have intuitive feelings sometimes we give it the gross name of gut feeling a gut feeling a sudden knowing of something is coming from the soul it is not being generated by thinking it's not being generated by the senses of the body and yet we very often reject it with the same mind this intuitive feeling i have gut feeling doesn't make sense to me i won't do it next day i wish i had listened to my intuition intuitive knowledge does not come <clears throat> from the time frame of a mind it comes from our own soul <clears throat> therefore we are now in a state where we came for a great adventure with so much equipment with us wonderful equipment <clears throat> an ability to love by becoming the many in one the ability to have true knowledge intuitive knowledge with our original consciousness the ability to enjoy the experience of intuitive knowledge and love through bliss and through that great inner happiness that we could not find with anything else except that intuitive knowledge and love gives the greatest happiness we can ever get and we closed it with a mind so that the mind can communicate this the mind can share it the mind can speak the mind can speak and communicate to the great experience to share with other units of consciousness other beings that are being created but we did not use the mind we started getting used by the mind instead of using a computer the most wonderful computer with so much ability instead of using a computer we became a slave of the computer we became slaves of our own minds instead of using the mind the way we want to use it the mind tells us what to do how could that be how did we reverse this whole thing because we could not identify our own self we forgot who we were and we began to identify ourselves the mind i think that's me totally incorrect i think that's me is not correct correct word would be i am life i am consciousness i have a mind and i use the mind to think i have a mind therefore i use the mind to think it's my machine to use we forgot that and made the machine identify as our own self we forgot who we were we forgot what life is we forgot what consciousness is and began to take one machine which we have started which we are operating as our own self when i came to the united states in the beginning and try to talk about mind and soul as being distinct entities professor at harvard university were telling whatever you call mind or soul that means the conscious self in the brain they would not even distinguish between the mind and the soul they did not even distinguish between two functioning things in our own head working in a physical body one that is having the experience of love intuition joy bliss beauty and the one that is rationalizing sensing making thoughts in our head the two different distinct things happening and they could not even distinguish between the two it took me time to tell them these are different functions taking place within the human body 
with the human self. And we've even forgotten that part. We forget who we were. We forgot that the mind was only a machine given to us. And on top of that, the sense perceptions which were covered to enlarge the scope of perception. So the perception by the mind was total at all times. But we divided into seeing, touching, tasting, smelling separately to widen the scope of our experience. Yet we began to think they are separate from the mind. The mind only thinks, senses are separate. And then we put on this physical body through which the astral senses operate, through which the mind is operating, which have been all empowered and made alive by our own soul. We are taking this physical body to be ourself. And we are living a life thinking this is ourself and whatever happens to the body is happening to us. The body goes through pain and suffering. We say we are suffering. We can't separate and even see that the body suffers. We don't suffer. We are not the body. We are wearing it temporarily. And we can quit the body and come back into it anytime we like by quitting the consciousness of the body and going into a consciousness of a higher self. Which is possible while you are sitting in the body. Within this human body, which is the most complex and most wonderful thing ever created, I look at creation, I look at the vastness of space, I look at the microscopic nature of the molecular structures, of the atomic structures, of the neurons, and see, compare, is there something existing more complex, more wonderful, more well-designed than a human body and I can't find anything. Not only does it contain so much physiological elements which make it remarkable that having thousands of miles of nervous system running in a small compact body and several miles long of other systems running in the body and blood, blood carrying and emphatic uses carrying and a system working so autonomously that we don't have to tell the heart to beat and it keeps on beating. We don't tell any autonomous system to work. So many things are happening. Did you know the largest organ in the body? which is the most effective organ, is none that you teach you in the physiology class. It is bacteria. Bacteria weighs in an average adult about three pounds. It is heavier, it is heavier than all the three organs of this heart, stomach and liver put together. I was talking about the, the functioning of these systems and how the body is the most wonderful thing ever created. The more I examine it, the more I am struck by wonder. I am struck by the physiological structure of the body, which is amazing. And most of it working autonomously, without wanting my direction, how to do it. It's so complete. And then on top of that, the working of the sense perceptions, which gives me not only an idea there is a world around me, they create the world and then experience at the same time. It's an amazing feat being accomplished that when you see things, we don't realize we create at the time we see. It's simultaneous. And the mind has the creative power which is used through the sense perceptions to create perception. And the whatever we perceive is being created while we perceive it. It's amazing that we have no knowledge of any world around sight except through our sense perceptions. Sense perceptions are the only guarantee that there is a world around us. If we don't have self-perception, the world disappears. And yet we think the world is independent of us. And we just come for a short time because we identify with the body. Supposing you identify with the sense perceptions. Supposing you could become unaware of the body. Supposing you die, you're still left with sense perceptions. What would you see? You see the world still is there because of your sense perceptions. It's not because of your body. Your body was not creating anything. Your body was merely giving expression to an identity of yours. You were identified by one costume you were wearing. When you go to a theater in an act, the costumes are being worn by these characters. A barber in my, in my neighborhood used to act as a king on the stage. And he wore the king's royal thing, but he was still a barber. When he came out from the stage, he was a barber. When he was on the stage, he was a king. We have become kings on the stage and we think we are kings all the time. No, we were barbers somewhere else. We don't know who we were. Just by wearing a costume, we are assuming the, the role that we are playing as our permanent role. That's not true. 
So when we shed this outer costume, we discover who we are. And then we discover the sense perceptions have been created to generate the experience which we were having in a dumb way, in a very diluted way through the physical body. We see not because of our eyes, physical eyes, we see because we are alive. We see because we have awareness. If you're unaware, if you're unconscious, you don't see with the eyes open. Only when you're conscious, you can see with these eyes open. And if you take away these eyes and take away the physical body, you will still see. Any proof of that? Sure, there's proof right here. There's proof that if these eyes alone could see, we could never see anything in a dream. We could never imagine anything and see it. What eyes are seeing those right in the physical world? We are using these eyes, we close our eyes, we can think and have a vision of anything we like. Which eyes are those that are seeing that? Which eyes can pick up from memory a scene that we can see? Which eyes can create an imaginative image in our head? They are not physical eyes, but they are eyes. If you could remove the physical eyes and still use those eyes, you would find those eyes are responsible even for seeing with physical eyes. That physical eyes cannot see unless you have the astral astral, inner sensory eyes, which see. So when you die, you discover you can still see. And you thought that only your physical eyes were seeing. Physical body is lying dead, and you can still see. But you don't have to wait till you die to prove to yourself that this is true. You can pretend to be dead. This is the secret of verifying all the things I am saying. Everything I have said to you today or any other day, is a verifiable thing, verified while you are still in the physical body, verifiable today. And it can be verified by simulating death. That means you don't actually die, you keep your body intact, but you simulate death. How do you simulate death? How you pretend to be dead? You can do it by doing the same things which happen when the physical body actually dies. If you have seen people dying, you'll notice they don't die all at once. They die in the physical body progressively, starting from their extremities, their hands and feet. They don't know where the hands and feet have gone. Then the legs have gone, arms have gone, the beginning bottom of the torso has gone, goes up. The dying patient is still speaking in a hospital to us, but he doesn't know where these things are. And he tells us, I don't know, put my arm this side, the arm is already that side. Will you move my leg this side? And the leg is already there. The patient has become unaware of the extremities. Ultimately, when the attention, the life force is pulled up to the head and the brain dies, the man is dead. It's a process of gradually dying from the extremities of this physical body to the head. You can do the same thing while you are alive. You can do the same thing by discovering that what makes you know that you have hands and feet. What makes you know you have a body is your own attention upon these areas. You are scattering your attention into these areas and creating an experience of a body. If your attention is withdrawn, you won't know that you have a body. The extension of your uh, attention into the various parts of the body makes you know you have a body. It's not necessary to see it, you close your eyes, you still know you have the same body. How do you know? Your attention is scattered there. And through the scattering of this attention and the sense perception that operate inside this body, we have an immediate contact with another physical world. Attention goes there also. Imagine the nature of our attention. It is so scattered. It is scattered first through the body, then from the body all over the world, and then we have so much attachments, so many relationships with the physical world, it's all spread out there. Every time we close our eyes, so many thoughts come to us about the rest of the world. It's all attention, scattered attention. The scattered attention gives us an experience of our body and of this physical world. If attention is pulled away, everything disappears. If we can find a method of withdrawing our attention, back to for where it flows. It doesn't take long to find out where it's flowing from. It's flowing from the head, from behind our eyes. When we are awake in a physical body, if we say we are a unit 
of consciousness with no form, just a unit of consciousness operating to know where we are, to know what's happening. Where would you find it? You won't say it's in my hands or in my feet or in my legs. You know it's in your head. It's behind the eyes. You close your eyes, you're still behind the eyes. Somebody talks to you from the right side, you turn right, because as if you're thinking that you are operating from here. It's not difficult to know that when we are in the wakeful physical state, we operate from the behind the eyes at a certain point in the center of the head, which is the seat of our consciousness, sometimes referred to as the third eye, as the center of consciousness. That's where we operate from. That's where consciousness spreads through attention everywhere. Now, if we withdraw attention systematically with a definite method of withdrawal, taught by somebody who has already done it, taught by somebody who is very expert in this, adept in this, and we withdraw our attention progressively, we we'll forget where our hands and our arms are, forget where our body is, and eventually forget we have a body. And yet we are still there, more there than we are there now. We discover that our sense perceptions open up in a way we couldn't imagine. Here we had weak eyesight, we were using glasses, suddenly our vision becomes so clear. Have you ever noticed that even if your eyesight is weak in the physical body, in the dreams you don't wear glasses, you see very clearly. In higher levels of consciousness, you see very clearly. Don't you, do you know that you can't have problem with smell if you're having a cold? But in the sensory system, you always smell so wonderfully. And I do these experiments with you where I say, imagine flowers. Everybody is able to smell flowers without there being any flowers, just by using the internal sensory system. Always very accurate. Sense perceptions grow to a remarkable extent when we don't have a body. The body is not helping us to see or touch or taste or smell. Body is covering us up so we can only little partial use of our senses. You become unaware of the body and the senses open up. You realize sense perceptions were not physical body. That's a separate body. It appears to be like this one because the attention in the sensory systems is divided exactly like it divided this body. That we can still feel we have legs and feet and that, but when we see there are no legs and feet, and still we feel we have. We try to walk in the astral body when we are dead or when we pretend to die or when we simulate death by a special method, when we withdraw attention and only move with our sensory systems, we find that we have no physical body, yet we can do everything that we could do with our sense perceptions. And then we find since we don't have a body, we feel like to fly, we fly, there is no gravity left. That inner self of ours does not follow any law of gravity. Apparently, there are different laws operating when we are only using our sense perceptions. And that is why the sense perceptions, they take us up and we have a totally new experience. Now, if we could do the same thing again, supposing you withdraw your attention from the senses, where? In the head which is still operating in the astral body, in the sensory body. You withdraw yourself and you withdraw completely from your senses. You are still there in a much more real way than you are here or in the sensory body. There you discover that your life force, which is your soul, only is covered with your mind, the thinking mind and the creative mind that's around you, that's creating time and space. There you discover how time and space were created. There you discover how events were placed there. There you discover how your destinies were made. There you discover how differentials between us took place. It's all there. It's not somebody else is telling us. We have it in us. Each one of us has this old storehouse of information. Only if we were to become unaware of the external form and go to the inner form, we discover these things. But that's not the end of the journey. That's the end of the journey so far as you are discovering what creates this world, what this world is all about, how you are here, why we were here, how destinies were created, how the past, present and future were created, how karma was created, you get all the answers directly. But you still don't know who you are. You are still tied up with the mind. Now, that's the most difficult part, to leave the mind behind and release the soul from the mind. 
That's the most difficult part, and that cannot be done by any method of withdrawal of attention. No method of meditation has ever done it. People talk of meditating and going to heavens, yes. All heavens are in the astral stage. You can go there, it's still in space and time. Heavens are beautiful places. You can also go into hell, also lying there in the same level. You can go into high pleasures and very big tortures at the same area. They exist. Anybody can experience them. You can go to higher levels where you discover the universal mind as the mind of all minds and discover that's the ultimate. But you cannot separate the soul from the mind by any kinds of meditation. Because all meditation is somehow a physical exercise, an exercise on attention, an exercise on a mental capacity called attention. Attention is not a spiritual thing. Attention is a mental thing. It's an extension of the mind. When you put attention on something, you're using your mind. How can you use the mind to go over the mind and beyond the mind? Therefore, meditation stops there and never has taken anybody beyond. Whoever claims that he has gone to a true home to such kind by meditation is talking only of the astral stage. And people talk about it like that is such kind. That's a true home. They describe it in vivid detail as if there is space and time where it exists. It does not. There is no space and time where a soul belongs. It is pure consciousness beyond all these. So therefore, if you are within these three realms of the physical world, or the astral sensory world, or the world of the mind, the mental world, you go into cycles of birth and rebirth over and over again, no matter how high you have gone. Because all these forms of life, the physical form of life, not necessarily human, any physical form of life has a time of birth and a time of death. It must be born and must die. The astral system of senses must be born and must die. The mind must be born and must die. Of course, the time frame in which they exist is different. The physical body is a very short physical time of 100 years, sometimes less, sometimes a little more. It's not very too much time compared to cosmic time we are counting in our experience itself around us in terms of the Big Bang Theory and billions of light years and so on. It's a very small time frame. It's like seconds in a clock. This small time is only the age of this physical body. And we are, when we think we are that, imagine how we reduce our experience to just a speck of time. The astral time, or the time of a sensory system, which outlasts this physical body, and through which we can come into several forms of life, physical and otherwise, is 1,000 to 3,000 of physical time, and the astral body dies and comes up afresh with a new birth. The mind which is carrying all our karma, all our past experiences, to generate new experiences, observing the law of cause and effect, the mind itself has a limited time. In terms of human physical time, it's uh, about 3 million years is a good lifetime for a mind. After 3 billion years, it goes, a new mind comes up. Mind dies, mind is born. Imagine if you are only going to go to these levels of experiences. If you're not gone out of the trap of coming again and again within the same cycle of the three worlds, you are still trapped in the three worlds of the physical, the astral, and the causal. The world of this physical body, the world of the sensory systems, and the world of the thinking mind. You have not crossed that at all. To cross that, you must use something that lies beyond. You cannot use the system that operates here, body, senses, or thinking, or repeating words, or mantras. You can't use any of these. Or use any form of attention to go there. And none of these work. When I was talking of the Guru, I was saying in spiritual tradition, a Guru is God himself in a human form. Is a creative power himself in a human form because he has the awareness of totality, the same awareness we ascribe to the ultimate God. But when we use the word God, the creator, we are not even referring to the ultimate. We are referring to the creator of the physical universe. We are referring to the God that 
presides over the astral system and the physical body. And because whole creation of the physical is taking place from there, we say God is sitting up in a throne. Of course he's sitting there. And we've given different names to it. We have given names of that God who creates the astral and the physical plane. We call him God. Ishwar, Parameshwar, Allah. We call him Zeus. Of course, they all sit in time and space. And they can all be seen by anybody who goes there. It's not necessary to follow one religion in order to see the creator. We have given different names to the same creative power that exists in the astral plane from where these two worlds are being created. But we have not even discovered the source of our own mind when we start calling that creator as the ultimate creator. Even the universal mind from where the whole universes are being created, the mind itself is creating time and space. Even that is not our true God, true creator. Hardly very few people reach there. Then they discover who they were calling God. Was it just a creation of God himself? Was not a part of the creative power. But when you reach there, that's the limit. There's no method we know of. Therefore, if one wants to go to those levels, we can find the gurus, many gurus. Of course, the bulk of the gurudom in recent history, especially in Eastern history, in the history of India, China, and those countries, has been confined to discovering energy forms, energies of different kind within the physical body and the energy centers below the eyes. They haven't even gone into higher awareness. And we still call them gurus. We call them yogis. The performance of yoga in the six energy centers below the eyes gives experiences of energy, has never given any experience of higher awareness. Nobody has become more aware of the nature of this creation, of the nature of the creator, by performing any kind of yogic exercise that goes below the eyes into the energy centers. How could it? There is no God residing below. If there is anything residing, it's lying inside our own consciousness. If our own consciousness in the wakeful state is lying behind the eyes, in the head, how can lower centers of energy, which operate to run the system here, which operate to run our body and the environment around our body and experiences around our body, give us knowledge of God? The yoga has never given any knowledge of God. Not this kind of yoga that relies upon the energy centers below. There is no center of awareness below the eyes. All centers of awareness lie within the head, in the brain area only, and they lie behind the eyes, in the center and above, nothing below. But when you put your whole attention on the centers below, how can you get any experience of higher awareness? But higher awareness has its limits. From the yogis and yogeshwars who are specialists, in the centers of energy, which they call the six chakras, they do not go anywhere higher. But the gurus who go higher, and they are many, not too many, but many, and they are able to take us to astral levels, where we see the heavens, and where we see the creator of these universes. But even they have gone only one step on the spiritual ladder, and there are very few who can take us beyond the astral into the region of the universal, the universal mind, the universal creative power from where everything is coming, including the creation of the gods. But that is also not neither our true self nor our true creator. And we are blocked there. Now, this is what distinguishes between the gurus and we, what we call the perfect living masters. When we say PLMs, we are not only talking of masters, we are talking of perfect living masters. What causes imperfection is the mind. Therefore, anybody who goes up to the region of the mind is not a perfect master. He is still dealing with imperfection because the mind divides everything and by dividing makes it imperfect. It cannot see the whole. The mind can never see the total picture. No matter how hard it tries, its process its process of knowledge is based upon analysis. Break things open and see. It lacks the process of synthesis, which consciousness per se has, the soul has, but the mind does not. The approach of mind always is to break things open and see how they operate. The approach of the soul always is see the big picture. 
What does it look like? It's a big difference. Analysis, synthesis. So the mind cannot actually discover the total. Therefore, it remains imperfect all the time. And all things that are mental remain imperfect. All these three worlds are imperfect. When we talk of perfect living master, we are talking of no masters of these regions. These regions are producing masters. They'll take you to higher awareness also, but they will not take you to perfection, which lies beyond the mind. But there are some who will take you beyond. Again, very rare now. Those rare ones who have the knowledge and awareness of something beyond the mind, they come and tell us this is just a function of covers upon ourselves. Our true self is the soul, not these mind senses and the body. They try to take us beyond that. And the only process through which we can cross the mind is through something that belongs to the soul. Love. Only when you are pulled by unconditional love from the other side can you cross the mind. Because meditation doesn't go there. A repetition of mantras doesn't go there. Even listening to the sound does not go there. Only love goes there. What we call the sound, the ultimate creative sound, the word, the shabd, is actually love. And it comes from beyond the mind. When you experience that love, and you are devoted to that love, when love and devotion becomes your method of spiritual life, you can cross the mind. That's a big deal to be able to go over and gloss over these things like the physical body, gloss over our sense perceptions, become unaware of our mind and senses, and then be pulled by love. But that's when you're ready for going beyond the mind. When you're ready, somebody's love, which is coming from beyond the mind, pulls you through this great veil, the biggest block coming between the mind and the soul. And when you cross that, you discover you were never any of these three things. They were covers upon yourself, the mind, the senses, and the body. And then you realize who you were, the soul. Such masters, we call perfect living masters or sad gurus. We still don't call them sad gurus because they have revealed to us the Atma. They have taken us to Parabrahm, which I quoted right at the beginning, that these are masters are sakshat, that means physical, visible forms of Parabrahm. They're visible form because they can take us right there. And there we discover you are a soul, a unit of consciousness, a part of God a part of ultimate creator, ourselves. And all things were created with the power of consciousness of the soul. That's the biggest discovery. And we still classify these sadhgurus as part of the spiritual perfect living masters because they've taken us beyond the mind. But even amongst perfect living masters, there are others who will now take us even beyond the soul and <clears throat> tell us the soul is also a cover. It's a cover of individuation to make you feel you are separate from the total. You never were separate. You are merely a point of view of the total. You are always part of the total. And those who take you to that point and tell you, you are the one and the many at the same time, that's your reality. You are the ultimate creative power. You are the word that all these people speak about. Other things are not part of this. They we call, those we call the Sat Gurus, the Gurus of Truth. So when we say Satguru, we are referring to those. Sadguru, also perfect living masters, take you to Parabrahm, beyond the mind, and reveal to you your soul. And then other gurus, Brahm, Brahmagyani gurus, they take you up to Brahm, or the creative power of the mind. And then there are other lesser gurus who take you up to the astral plane. They are gurus who are playing around with the energy centers below, whom we call yogis and yogeshwars. <coughs> So I wanted to clarify to you today that these words are being used about a guru and a satguru very loosely without people knowing what's the distinction. So there's a big distinction between these experiences that we have. If one is seeking in the heart only to find heaven, you'll find a guru who will take you to heaven. He will take you to the astral plane because all those lie there. So many masters have come in history who have promised you heaven 
اینڈ وی گو لو ہیپلی ایور ایور آفٹر ٹل آور ٹرم فنشز وی کم بیک ان ٹو ہیلتھ اور کم بیک ان ٹو دی ورلڈ وچ وی میک ہیل آور سیلس سم ٹائم وی ڈونٹ نیڈ ٹو گو ٹو ہیون پیپل کین میک دس لائف ان ٹو ہیون اینڈ آلسو میک دس ویری لائف ان ٹو ہیل بٹ دی اپرچونیٹی فار آس ٹو پلے ود دا ورلڈ ہیئر از گریٹ دیر آر سولس ہیونگ ڈفرینٹ فارمس ایٹ آل دیز لیولس physical level we see people around us they all have souls same soul soul is no different identical we see plants growing outside each one has same soul we have trilly trillions of bacteria sitting inside us each one same soul we have angels governing the guardianship of many over here same soul we have the creative powers of creators of heavens and this universe same soul we have people living for millions of years in the high regions same soul a little insect is crawling here same soul soul is not different soul is the power of consciousness the power of life that makes a form a life these are forms being created the forms are created starting from the causal plane which gives the concept of what kind of forms can be created to the astral plane where the forms take something that can be observed by the senses which get color and shape the physical plane we are born as physical things as physical species of life so these are forms but the soul is still the same soul has no karma never had never wanted to never got soul just made the mind alive and the mind created karma and carried it the mind created karma soul picked it up let me try this one let me try a new mask now let me put on a new costume and see how that works and we picked up our own karma we picked up a karma laden on the mind never belong to us soul never has created nor born nor suffered any karma but when we put on a costume that's undergoing those things we think is our own experience we took it for a purpose just to have the right we knew we could shed it and become karma free but while we are wearing that costume of a mind which carries karma we are bound by the laws of karma then we put on sensory perceptions karma gets translated into sensory experiences we put on a physical body karma becomes an experience in the physical world that's what we are going through and we are thinking is my karma not true it's your mind's karma being played out through the senses and the body you are providing life for the karma to play out you are providing life and the life force vital force to these covers upon yourself to have different experiences that doesn't mean they belong to you you can step out of it you can step out of it any moment the method that i am suggesting to you is why wait for 100 years to die and experience what's happening why wait for 3000 years for the astral body to die before we know what the mind is why wait for millions of years for the mind to die and then say well, we are a soul when you can find all that today wearing all the costumes as they are if we have the ability to find these things out while we are still in the physical body why not try it out now when we can and be happy forever by knowing the truth about the whole show knowing the truth that we are souls the karma is a game we are playing with our bodies with our costumes and the physical world is merely show place we are actors we have become actors and we have got all actors created by us playing on a big stage just because we have placed ourselves inside one mind and created other minds around just because we have put ourselves in one sensory system and see all other sensory systems with their own minds as separate just because we have placed ourselves in one physical character to watch from inside the show and created all other physical characters around us it was only to make the show so interesting it was not intended to trap us into this whole system and think this is the reality we came for a great adventure 
I truly believe that this creation was supposed to be a great adventure for us, for the soul. We forgot it was for adventure. We began to identify ourselves more with the costumes than with our own true nature. And the costumes became ourselves. And we are thinking, we are the costumes, so we suffer. That's why we are suffering. That's why life has become very different from what it was intended to be. But we can switch any time. We can switch life from an area of suffering into an area of adventure merely by gaining back the awareness of who we are. We don't have to go anywhere. We just have to get back the awareness of who we are, how this, all these covers upon us are operating. If we can just do that, we can switch our life right now from one of suffering, drifting through, living terribly till we die, into one where we have come to put on costumes, to see a variety of experiences. Great show, great actors, great drama, great hype of the drama. We can see that right now. It will change our experience, not when we go back home. It will change our experience from here, from tomorrow. It will be a different life. So that is why these perfect living masters who come with that awareness, carrying with that awareness at all times, not that they had one, once upon a time, they carry that awareness of totality, even while they sit amongst us here. When they come and tell us that this is not the truth, what you are seeing, to just set up and set up so that you can go through the experience of a roller coaster, high and low, and the experience of becoming like your true self. They say man, which means human beings, man is created in the image of the creator. I've heard that many times and I was used to wonder, does it mean the creator also has eyes to see? Does it mean the creator also is like having a body or something? Not at all. The creative power is just a creative power. Then what is similar? How is man made like that creative power? Only one thing is common between the creative power and a human being. The creative power has the will to create. And we have a free will to decide. That's the only common thing. And that's why a human being is made in the image of the creator. The Creator willed, the Creator willed all show to take place, and it happened. The Creator willed in no time for time and space to be created, and all things happened by that will. And we have a free will operating as if we can create our destinies. We can create new things. We can make choices. We can do what we like. This is a common feature. Only human beings have it. Insects and plants don't have it, animals don't have it, angels don't have it. God who run these universes don't have it, because they have full knowledge of the whole will, and we don't. Our ignorance is truly bliss, that in ignorance we think we can decide what will happen tomorrow, without knowing that tomorrow has already been placed on the event list, way at the time of original creation. Therefore, when somebody says, do you have free will? The answer is yes. We exercise it every day. How can anybody say I don't have free will? You tell me it is written that you won't drink water from here. That's the free, that's the will. Okay, I'll break it. I just broke it with my free will. Supposing you said you are going to drink water because it's written up there in destiny. I said, no, I won't drink it. I just destroyed this whole concept of predetermination by one little act. How can somebody say everything is predetermined when I'm breaking it all the time? We are all breaking it all the time. We all have free will. Then what is meant by this statement that everything is predetermined? Well, there are many considerations in this. One, do we believe in a creator, in a God who knows everything? Because we define him like that. God is omnipresent. He's present everywhere. God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. God is omniscient. He knows everything. Does he know I am going to drink water or not? If he doesn't know, he can't be God. If he knows I am going to drink water or not, my thinking, whether I should drink or not, also is known to him. That means what I think is my free will is actually not that free because if he knows, I am just thinking I have got free will. Really, I don't because somebody else knows. 
Therefore, on theological grounds, free will is ruled out. If God knows everything, we have no free will. But we surely have an experience of free will based upon what? Based upon ignorance of what is going to happen the next second. Ignorance of what is going to happen in the next five minutes. Ignorance of the future. Ignorance is making us believe that we have free will and we've decided our head in consciousness, I'm going to do this or not going to do this, which is the basis of free will, choice making. Because I can make a choice, therefore I have free will. Somebody has already laid down how I will make a choice. So what kind of free will is this? But sitting here, if I claim I have no free will, it's useless to say that, because here I am having free will. People say, if everything is predetermined, I want to sit home and not, and not meditate. Why? He says, I have no free will. I said, do you know that your decision not to meditate is also part of the predetermined thing? How can you separate one part of your decision making from the rest and say, everything is predetermined, but I can do that? Don't you realize if everything is predetermined, what you think you can do that is also predetermined? Therefore, we get caught into this because of the ignorance of the future and the choice making still available to us. This is a very subtle thing that distinguishes a human being, a human form of life from all other forms of life. Because when we are ignorant of the future and we feel and experience free will, experience choice making, we can choose to go back home. We can choose to follow a spiritual path. It might have been written up earlier. But at least it looks like we are choosing now. And because we are choosing now, it works. No matter whether it's written somewhere else or not, at least here, we make a choice, we seek and we find. Therefore, the question is, do we have a free will or is it totally governed by God? Now that question is very tricky. I'll tell you why it's a tricky question. Because when we say, is it our free will or God's will that's prevailing, looking like our free will, we forget who is God. Who is God? God is our own totality. God is ourself in our total form. Therefore, there's really no distinction between God's free will and our free will. It's the same free will, whether we call it God's free will or our own. Because we have always been part of God, never separated. In fact, our total identity is the same as identity of God. It's only when we go to the highest level of consciousness and realize the totality of consciousness, we discover that that in us is no different. When I was a child, my mother said, you should learn little music also. So we used to have a musical instrument called a harmonium in India. And many kids used to learn. So I, I called a teacher and he taught me how to play the simple tune on the harmonium and a little song. The words of the song were very simple, very refrain, short for all phrase. It said, in translation, a drop is addressing the ocean and saying, you are no different from me, we are both water. Today, I use that as a thought for the day every morning. That the drop of the water is no different than the water in the ocean. The essence is the same. And when we find out that not only essence is the same, but where are we located, it solves a much bigger riddle. As I was growing up again and repeating to myself, Dariya se hawa kahe ye sada, tu aur nahi, main aur nahi. A drop is telling the ocean, you are no different from me, we are both water. I, as I was repeating, I said, what a senseless thing for the drop to have left the ocean and now working hard to go back. And people told me, the soul is a drop from that ocean of consciousness, separated for eons, for millions of years, trying very hard to go back to its true home and struggling to go back. I also began to struggle. Then I thought to myself, this is a useless struggle. I'm telling you my own thinking as I was growing up. Such a useless struggle that if I am a drop of water, 
I am experiencing myself as a drop. The sun shines on me and spreads the rainbow color on me. And I so, look so beautiful. And I am so wonderful. I make little droplets of myself and combine and become a drop. I am having such wonderful experiences as a drop. What will happen if after all my struggle and go and merge in that ocean, which is the spiritual path they were telling me, the spiritual path is for the drop of ocean, struggling for eons, for millions of years, to go back and merge in the totality of ocean. I'll be, it's like committing suicide for me. I'll be finished as a drop. Nothing will be left. What will the ocean gain by one more drop in it? It's the worst lose-lose game I could think of. And it's called the spiritual path. I said, how can one follow such a path? And I was totally dismayed. Till the real discovery came to me much later. Indeed, I am a drop of consciousness. Indeed, I am a drop of the ocean. But I never left the ocean. I was always in the ocean. What did I lose? Awareness that I am in ocean. Awareness. My awareness was contracted to the size of a drop. And I began to think, I am a drop. All drops around me. And I am playing a game. When my awareness expanded, I discovered I was the ocean at all times. I never left it. That made sense to me. That is the true spiritual path. The true spiritual path is you have never left your true home. That you are still there. You lost the awareness of it. And by creating a series of experiences, you felt you were far away from your true home. And when you go rise from one level of experience to another, from one level of consciousness to another, you get closer and closer in your awareness to the totality. Ultimately, you find you are the total all the time. That makes sense. Now we are discovering our true self, which is very different from a drop going and merging in an ocean. So that is why now it makes sense to me that we should be able to enlarge our awareness to discover who we really are. And these steps we are talking about of expanding our consciousness, removing the covers that we wore in order to have different kinds of adventures, removing them and discovering that we were the makers of the will of all the characters, including the character in which we are sitting now. We are sitting in one character in a play. If we were sitting outside, it would be easy to see the play. We go to a movie, the screen is at a distance from us. We are sitting in the audience. We see the show going on there. Although we forget, it's just a shadow play. We forget they're just pictures. We think they are real. We even cry. We are, something is going to happen at the edge of our seat. Now what will happen next? Although we are taking it as so real, we are not taking it to the reality that we are part of it. We are separated it. But supposing the show took place on a screen inside us, we would rattle the bite as if we are part participating in it. That we are part of it. It's our show. We are in it. So to enhance the beauty of this show, instead of trying systems of 3D, stereoscopic, you see they put stereoscopic glasses now. <clears throat> you go and see a 3D movie, different from other movies. It makes the screen come to you. In Orlando, Florida, in the Disney world, there's a show in which they wear glasses. They used to be green and red glasses. The movie was shot in two colors from the distance of the eyes, and you could see things moving towards you. And now they use Polaroid glasses, which have no color, so it looks even more real. So you wear those, and all things become, because the two eyes have taken camera, two cameras have taken the picture. In the same way, the two eyes see. And because two eyes create sense of depth, therefore the two glasses they give free. At the entrance of the cinema, you see things moving towards us. I went and saw a movie, and there's a truck carrying a lot of rats and mice. Suddenly the door opens, and the rats run into the audience. Everybody picked up their feet. <laughs> and they could all feel the rats, because they had installed little a little air, air tubes inside the seats. And when the rats came, they put the air out. And we could feel the rats inside. Everybody screamed, the rats have come. It was a movie. 
Nothing had moved. And then such a stink came, which also was placed in the, in the, in the chairs. Imagine they are trying to make a reality to come to you from a screen by these little devices. And what a great device we created, much better than these, by not sitting away from the screen, but sitting in the screen, sitting inside one of the characters on the screen. Imagine the way you see a show like that. The physical world is no different than that. We are the same witnesses, the spectators of the show, sitting in one character inside, the consciousness and the head of one character, and thinking we are that character. If we remember, we are not that character. We are the audience, having placed ourselves in one character. And our body is a character like any other character around us. And then watch the show. Your whole life changes from that moment onwards. Imagine it's all a game of awareness. It's a game of what you know. If you know that is a show set up and that you cannot change anything, the film was sh shot long ago. When we see a movie, it's not being pre uh, prepared at that time. There's a film behind us. It's a, it consists of single shots, rolled together fast. It moves fast, gives the sense of mo motion on the screen. There's a light behind the projector. If the light fails, the film go goes. If the movie stops, it becomes one shot only. It's all based upon a light shining through a moving film, which is casting a shadow on a screen, and we think it's real. Nobody in the hall, in the audience, looks back to see how it's working. They only see and say it's real. It looks so real. I tell a story of a young man from a young boy from a village in India who had never seen a movie. When he came first time to the town to see a movie, a Hindi movie, Indian movie. In that movie, during one of the scenes, a girl comes to have a bath in a pond of water and she's taking off her clothes when a train passes in front. And by the time the train goes, the girl is already in the water. He never gets a chance to see her taking off her clothes. Being a young adolescent, he's very keen on seeing that scene. He came 20 times to the movie, hoping one day the train will be late. That's how we live life here. We live life as things are happening and they will change. They never change. And only a few steps inside can reveal to us where the movie was shot, where it was captured, in the causal plane. The movie was prepared in advance in the causal plane. And that is where we are working out and just watching the movie by setting up one of the characters. Imagine if you got this direct knowledge not just by listening to me, but by actually experiencing that you are that. So just place yourself to see a pre earlier prepared movie that you're going through. Wouldn't life change automatically? What would you do then? You would be sitting in the audience, which means in the head, smiling, enjoying the movie. Or well, the body moves, other things are happening. All events are taking place around you and you enjoy. And when you want to go home, you switch, go home, and come back to see the movie in the theater called The Human Body, whenever you like. Do you know this is possible? Possible right here. It does not require you to go into any caves, or into mountains, or into retreats, or into any jungles and forests to meditate. It only requires you to discover what is inside you, what's behind your eyes. Who are you? A discovery of who you are will reveal all this and it can be done progressively by the method of simulating death of one body over another by withdrawal of attention. A meditation is a process of meditating upon yourself and not meditating on anything else. Meditating upon yourself means thinking all the time about what is inside. If you just start this one and Every religion can do it. That's the amazing thing. Christians can do it. Jews can do it. Hindus can do it. Sikhs can do it. Atheists can do it. Non-believers can do it. Believers in any other system can do it. And nothing to do with religion at all. It's a question of discovering who you are. And you discover by putting your attention behind the eyes and finding out who are you. 
सिंपल क्वेश्चन आर्क योर सेल्फ इफ आई एम नॉट दिस बॉडी हु एम आई हु एम आई ऑपरेटिंग हियर एम आई सिटिंग इन साइड वॉट इज माई फॉर्म वॉट इज माई शेप वॉट एम आई डूइंग हियर कैन आई सी फ्रॉम हियर इज एनी थिंग अराउंड मी डू आई सी एनी पैटर्न हु इज सींग दैट जस्ट गोइंग ऑन आस्किंग हु यू आर एंड देन कैन आई जस्ट डू वॉट आई लाइक एम आई बाउंड बाई द बॉडी कैन आई जस्ट गेट अवे एंड फ्लाई आउट कैन आई डू ऑल दीज अदर थिंग्स एंड यू कैन दैन हु इज दैट विच इज विद इन मी हाउ इज हैविंग दीज कैपेबिलिटीज ऑफ सींग ऑफ फ्लाइंग दैन यू फाइंड यू आर द वन आस्किंग दीज क्वेश्चन यू आर द माइंड थिंकिंग माइंड एंड देन यू गो फर्दर हाउ कैन द माइंड थिंक हु इज एम्पावरिंग द माइंड टू थिंक यू गो फर्दर इन यू डिस्कवर यू आर the life force the vital force that's making the mind think you are that which makes the sen- senses work you are that which is making the body work you are the soul you discover the soul simple process of course you need practice we need practice because we have been moving in the other direction all our life taking the reality outside not inside following reality outside continuously trying to remove our loneliness of inside by making relationships outside which never work they work for a little while then they break down nobody understands us here nobody loves us here nobody really cares for us here we are trying to look for something that's far more akin to our own consciousness the <coughs> consciousness of love joy beauty and intuitive knowledge that's what we're looking for and we don't find it outside and yet we're trying to search very hard outside so that is why when you withdraw your attention within that's the way to the to your true self and to your creative self so this is in short what can change our lives from now on it's not a matter of waiting for something religion promises things religion promises this is what will happen spirituality says here and now religion makes you believe things on the experience of somebody else spirituality depends upon your own experience religion creates differences amongst us by dividing and by saying this particular way is the only way your own experience shows there was only one way religion takes us more into outward ceremonies and rituals and in what you know they are all tying you down to outside things and there is no ritual required for finding your own self therefore big separation between religion and spirituality and what i am talking about is a spiritual path not a religious path as it happens and i am very happy for that as it happens this spiritual path for the fundamental basis of all religions human beings departed departed from the expressions of this true knowledge by the founders of religion if you study very carefully all the scriptures we ascribe as word of god if you go to the scriptures you will find that they have described the same thing that the truth can only be found inside that even a living god lives inside us that the kingdom of god is within and not outside they say the same things and yet we go to worship in any of these religions they tell us what to do outside they don't tell us to go inside so we have departed from spirituality which was the foundation of religion into external and external ceremonies external activities which we call religion today yet i tell people of all faiths and all religions practice your own faith practice study first then practice we don't even study we just keep on repeating what we are reading and think the repetition of words is going to give us salvation how can it how can a mental activity like reading of words written somewhere still be called salvation has anybody ever got salvation by reading anything i know of no instance at all whoever got enlightenment got enlightenment from within themselves and then they reveal to others if you want to find it go within yourself and we don't try that that is why the spiritual path is a simple one like one mystic bulle shah says who says it is difficult to find god you can get god just by pulling 
your attention from here over here. He makes it so simple. It's all a question of putting your attention where the self exists, where the creator of the self exists. And it's always inside yourself, not outside. We'll have a short break. And uh, some people have come from outside who never met me. I'd like to meet them during this break. And there was a couple of other people who had requested to see me in the break. And if they are here, they might like to come and see me. Thank you very much.